that is the rain and oh yeah anyway listen we'll get started it's, it's yeah. a minute past three really appreciate it and I'll, I'll do the formal introduction and thanks now and, right. and thanks again um so we are live now and i'm starting to see loads of people streaming in um i'll do a slow entry to allow everybody in through the turnstiles uh good afternoon and welcome to everybody but welcome to our very important guests, Professor Luke O'Neill, Professor of Biochemistry and Immunology at Trinity College Dublin. Good afternoon, Professor, and thank you very much for your time today. Hi, Frank, no problem. I have, just for, the, for everybody out there listening and, and listening later, uh, I have merged some of the questions because they're, they're, some of them are around key topics which we're going to discuss. And then anyone having technical difficulties, I've been advised to tell you to just shut down the stuff in the background whether it's browsers or emails, just shut that stuff down and give Zoom as much power as you can because that will help with your signal and anything like that. But anyway, look, we'll kick off. Uh, we're, we're in three sections today. We're going to talk about continuing to live with COVID, just some tips and advice. We're nearly out of the woods, but there's a bit to go. So let's, let's double down on our efforts. The new variants, what's going on, which have proven to uh, some weird news coming through on those. And then finally, vaccination and all the questions we can answer to vaccination. So good afternoon, Luke, and, and I'll kick straight off with Brendan Walsh from Nutgrove, Loretto Menshed had a question, and we mentioned this before, but just to double down, do, does vitamin B, C and D help with boosting immunity and therefore help against the virus? Yeah, I can help with that one, Frank, for definitely. We know a lot about this, by the way. I mean, any kind of nutritional thing, you need to know how it's affecting the immune system in a really kind of precise way because there has been a history of snake oil, want of a better word, you know. So, um, but those vitamins are critical for the, the, like every part of your body needs vitamins, I guess, but the immune system has to work very hard. So you need a good supply of vitamins to keep the immune system fully intact, I guess. Now with the B groups and the C group, you can get those in your diet. I mean, a regular healthy, don't do anything special, you know. Regular diet, good mix of fruit and veg and all the usual things that we all know about. So I wouldn't be supplementing those necessarily, unless you're in a, a, a malnourished group. Some people are slightly malnourished, you know, but most people just a regular diet's fine. Uh, vitamin D is a bit different because there's really good evidence that immune cells need vitamin D particularly. And I'll give you one example, actually. So we, we work on an immune cell called a macrophage. It's a great name, it's big eater. This cell is in your blood, it eats the virus up, you know? It needs vitamin D to do the eating, I'll tell you, and there's loads of good evidence for that. Now, the question is, can you get that in your diet? Now, in the winter, you, it may, you may, in your skin, by the way, that's probably been all the sunlight helps. It, it was first shown to be needed for your bones, interestingly, you know? Yes. And then they realized it's needed for the immune system as well. And your skin can make it, but the trouble is in winter, not enough sunlight. So you have trouble making it, especially if you're older, actually. Yeah. Anybody over 50, probably, you would say, including myself now in that category. If you don't get enough sunlight, and you're not having a good diet, you could take a supplement of vitamin D. There's good, good advice there. You can get it in fish, though. You get it in meat, you know, so you can't get it in your diet as well, but uh, there's but no harm so, in taking it. No harm. Last thing, so. If you take too much vitamin C, vitamin C dissolves in water, okay? And that means you wee it away. If you take too much, your body gets vitamin. Vitamin D is different. It's, it's a fatty vitamin. That, that stays in your liver. So therefore, you don't get rid of it. So that's what it's more sense than taking extra vitamin D. Very good. Kevin Bates asks, please explain, can the virus live on hard surfaces and other materials on supermarket shelves, et cetera, parcels in the post and other places that yep. we touch? That's got much better now. There's, there's going to be good news and bad, bad news today, Frank, watch. But um, the good news there is it doesn't really live on surfaces. And certainly in the amounts that come out of your mouth and lands on a surface, there's tiny amounts of virus and it dies quite quickly if it's out in the open. The early work on that, they were putting huge amounts on a surface, like maybe 100 times. And lo and behold, they get to detect a bit later, you know, there's so much of it. But we don't think surfaces are playing a big role, it must be said. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. You still need to wash your hands just in case, though, because of the chance you've, you've, you've coughed into a tissue and you've touched that or this kind of thing, you know. So it still makes sense to keep the hands clean. But I wouldn't be wiping or doing too much surface wiping anymore. That seems to be a very low risk thing. The evidence in the past three months, and we know this in Ireland in spades, given what happened at Christmas, it spreads between two people. That's the bottom line, in a stuffy room. That's the main way we spread this virus. Um, Rudy Dore Pal asks, can pets get COVID and can they transmit it if they can get it? 
No, that, well, there's, there's rare examples of it going into a cat, for instance, not so much in dogs, but it's very rare. So we don't think those the domestic animals are a source. But one exception is mink, of course, and we saw that, didn't we? That's yeah. true. Mink can get infected and it can go from a mink back into a human, hence the need to restrict mink. Tragically enough, there was a lot of mink, mink calling out, and that was sensible because it can't go in, in mink farms where source sources spread. It can also go into, there's an interesting study on this again about three months ago, Certain, what happens there, by the way, is the virus has these spikes, as we know, and the spike latches into your lungs, into a special kind of lock and key mechanism. They've looked at the locks in different animals and other primates that can infect them for definite, like gorillas, for instance, mink, and strangely enough, dolphins and aquatic mammals, they're another one, you know, but every other creature doesn't seem to infect it, so we don't, don't need to worry too much about that. Okay, and this is a, a bit of a burning question. It's come up a few times, but John Thompson from Bruffman Shed asks us, can you catch COVID twice? That's a, such an important question. Now, the good, about as good news on this one as well. So the last couple of weeks, literally in the past two weeks, really good studies saying, if you get infected, there's a really good chance you don't get reinfected. And that was shown in a, in a group of healthcare workers in England. They followed them closely and they followed ones that weren't infected at the start. And the ones who had been infected, very low risk. I think it was two out of 208 he got reinfected over six months. And then a study in California, they could measure very strong immune signals eight months after infection in people. And that was a good sign as well. You know, yeah. and the vaccine did the same thing. It, the Pfizer vaccine, again, eight months later, good antibody levels. So that means the vaccine is going to stop you getting infected as well. So there's, there's, a, there's a set of risk, it must be said. But having been infected, your risk is lower. Right. Um, Brian McCormick asks, and that's quite a, a personal one, he has a daughter working with special needs children in England. She picked up COVID in December, but now they're saying she has long COVID. What really does this mean? Are there lasting effects? And is she still a carrier? And how long might that last for? Yeah, I wouldn't worry about the carrying. That doesn't seem to be the case. So in other words, what's going on here, and again, it's a worry, there's no doubt. And the level of this is slightly higher than other viruses. And what it is, is you get infected, your immune system fights the virus, you clear the virus from your body now, you're, you're kind of, it's called sterilizing immunity. But the trouble is the immune system is a bit still active. And we think it's kind of like an autoimmune thing. You, your immune system is overreacting to your own body and now you get long COVID. And that's a worry. I mean, there's a lot of work going into this because it's, it's quite common, you know? And, but I wouldn't worry about reinfection. But there's a couple of studies showing the virus might still live in your gut strangely, a tiny amount, but it can't come out. It just lives there, you know, that yeah. spread. So there's no, no real worries about, about, you know, spreading it on in a chronic way. But still, I'm sorry for that poor person. I mean, long COVID is a, is a, is a, is a troublesome thing for people, you know? And again, lots of workers trying to understand that more and more and come up with treatments. Yeah, and it's about switching off the autoimmune system, if you like. Yeah, it seems to be an autoimmune thing where the immune system is, obviously you can imagine, there's a fight going on your body, the invader goes in, the troops come out in droves, they kill off the bad guy, but now they're still active, you know, and they're causing fatigue and these other things because the immune system is on, on a bit of a hair trigger then, you know. Yeah. That's what we think long COVID is. Okay. Our thoughts go out. We'll switch to new variants now, if you don't mind. Um, they've been very topical in the news. I know you've been covering them extensively. Um, one question from Declan Fior and from St. Jude's Men Shed. You may or may not be able to. Know. What is what percentage of current coronavirus infections are due to? He calls it the British mutation, and yeah. what percentage of these are fatal? Is it more yeah. deadly? Is it more? Uh, you take it away. This is the central scientific question at the moment. Actually, not just in Ireland. Uh, that that variant is called B one one seven. It began in England. Uh, that's in fifty countries now. For example, there's also a South African variant. People have come across that. There's a Brazilian variant. They're the three main ones. There's at least three more coming up behind, actually. So, so we looked at this very, very closely. Now, um, what seems to be the case is they, they're more transmissible, which means they're 50% more transmissible than the old form. Now, that is a concern because that means it's harder to stop it spreading. If, it's, if it spreads more easily, you know, putting the fire out is more difficult. It's as if there's more tinder, I suppose, and the fire is going to go off more. That's one, not a bad analogy. So therefore, we got to, as you said, we're going to double down. Distancing masks become even more important in this situation. So it's being watched very, very closely. Now, the good news is there's no evidence that this makes you more sick. So there's no increased death rate from these, the, any of these. But the fact that they're more transmissible worries us because more people get infected anyway. And then it's, it's a numbers game. You get more in hospital than sadly more deaths. 
So we're watching this extremely closely. And in fact, um, our second concern is, will the vaccine protect against it? Now, that's a work in progress. We think it will. There's evidence it should, uh, but we still need to find out more on that. Uh, Pfizer released data, I think it was yesterday, saying that it does work in a test tube anyway against the new one, the B117, the, the British one, you know. So there's a bit of, there's grounds for optimism there. But again, we're watching that really closely. What I heard this morning is the EU might be mandating much more zealous measuring of the new ones. In, a, in Ireland, we're measuring it. We think it could be 20, 30 percent at the moment, actually, simply because it spreads more. You know, you see more of it. Yeah. Um, but they're going to probably going to mandate more close uh, analysis of this just to keep a very, very sort of close eye on it. Right. And e Evelyn Vaughan asks to that point, do we need to be wearing two layers of masks? Should we be wearing masks outdoors? What, should we up our game against these? Yeah, I think this, there'll be a shift in that watch. The German government are, are probably going to mandate wearing surgical masks because they're, they're a bit better. We know you're, you're not, not the hospital ones, just ones you can actually buy yourself. They're called surgical masks. Yeah. They work better than cotton masks anyway. That, there's evidence for that now. now. Now I'm talking like 20, 30 percent better, which could be significant. But that makes a bit of a difference. You know, the cotton ones are still good. Three layers are still great. They're probably as good as the surgical ones anyway, better than two layers, you know. But I can, I can see a shift maybe towards us all wearing surgical masks for a while because of this new variant being more transmissible. And why wouldn't we? It'll give us another way to stop it even more from spreading, you know. So we may see a shift in the advice there. And is it because more of it comes out of an infected person or is it the what does come out is more? No, than... what comes out is more, more sticky. Right. Is right. the way to think of it. The, the difference is in what's called the spike. Yeah. And the, the new variants have a slightly stickier spike. Now, what this means is you would get infected with a lower dose because more gets in, do you know what I mean? In other words, the previous one, you, you need twice as much to infect you kind of, you know. So lower amounts can, can spread is the idea here. And so therefore, it's even more important that we stop it spreading and, and hence the guidelines on, on the mask chain. Right. Listen, the, the good news, and there is good news, is around vaccinations. And, and there's a, yep. a, a ton of questions around vaccinations. And I suppose to start with the broader questions is, is you know, I suppose it's around the timelines and what your understanding of the timelines are. Um, yeah. And, and I suppose there's a few questions on that. Brian Byrne asked, when will the over 70s get vaccinated? Right. Yeah. Um, and so I suppose to start from that, that macro side and then we get yeah. into the micro questions, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I suppose the last time we spoke, we did another vaccine. Right? So it was great, great change since then. Let's start with that as a, as a positive sign. And I th we all thought it might take till March, April, actually, to get to this stage. And here we are in, in November, actually, when we got to the data. So yeah. that, that was like, we, it was a four or five months ahead of time, we felt, you know, which is yeah. tremendous. Um, and that's going to keep coming, by the way. There's more and more vaccines. I can see them ahead of me. I know them all. There's about six on the track ahead, by the way, you know. So by the time we get to May, June, there's going to be at least five in Ireland. Uh, so that's really good. Now, what they're saying now is, um, and we, we have to watch them on this and, and keep measuring and keep an eye on them. Uh, Stephen Donnelly says by March we'd have 700,000 people vaccinated. Now that includes everybody who's vulnerable. Now what I mean by that is anybody probably over 55, certainly over 60 by then, not just in nursing homes, which is what they're doing first of course, anybody in the country will have that done, uh, the healthcare workers, and then of course people with things like diabetes, obesity, you will, we will start getting, you know, contact from the health service saying your number, come on in, you know, kind of thing. And now, the other prediction is they're going to, as Stephen Donnelly this morning said this, he says by September, everybody who wants a vaccine will have had one. So that, that's right. what you're looking at, like full vaccination of the country then, you know. Yeah. Now, the question is, how long will it take? Uh, they're doing one group at a time. Now, we're doing very well here. We're, we're, we're second in Europe at the moment for the daily vaccination rate, which is tremendous news. So they're going to ramp it up. And, and, and as AstraZeneca comes on next, by the way, Suppliers are not going to issue. If I, if, I could, if I could do this, Frank, if I, if I could with a magic wand to vaccinate everybody now, I'd do it. You know, it's yeah. as simple as that. Yeah. And it's just a question of logistics, really. So people have to hang in there and very importantly, keep up with the measures in the meantime. Because uh -huh. there's a great phrase in the vaccine game, which has been around before COVID, no one's safe till we're all safe. You know, so we've got to get wide coverage, really, to, to ensure that the vaccines are fully effective for us. So keep in touch with your doctor, keep in touch with the post, yeah. make sure you're registered exactly. so you, you're, you're getting this information. Exactly. If work asks, does a person in their 80s need to be physically fit to benefit from the vaccine and avoid side effects? 
not necessarily no no any people frail people i mean there was a thing you may have seen last week a few people died on the Pfizer vaccine they were extremely frail and in fact they were people who were effectively had a couple of weeks to live you know so if so they're already kind of in a bad way so they won't give it to very frail people now how, how do you define frailty it literally is someone who, who we know is and it's, i know it's a sad thing to talk about but there are people that are coming towards the end of their lives and they're in their 80s and 90s you know so they probably won't be, but if you're reasonably healthy in your 80s, you don't need to be fit or anything, just you're, you're doing okay, absolutely take the vaccine. And, and we know the vaccines work in that age group, that's the other good part, they've, they've looked at the Pfizer one and the Moderna one, and the AstraZeneca one actually shows it was really good in the older people as well, which is really good. So there's no, there's no concerns there. Now, on, what I'd say is that if, you're, if you stay healthy as best you can, which means exercise and all you, then it might work a bit better, you know. So, that, so there's a good reason to try and stay healthy because it, the, the immune system is 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 in a good in a good shape. Then you know, and, and that, that's anybody. If you're in older people, exercise all the usual things. So so try and stay healthy, and it'll, it'll increase the, the uh, efficacy of the vaccine. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Finbar O'Reilly from Virginia Man says has very good. I said a member of our family got the BCG two years ago and got a reaction. Erythema nodosum. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. a bit of redness, yeah, and swelling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he is now he's now over 40. Which vaccines, if any, should he get? Also, if you get COVID after the vaccine, are there problems? Sorry, two questions in one there. But yeah. mostly around the reaction. Having yeah, gone. yeah. Now that, that's another important question that people are obviously concerned about. I reckon that BCG might have been a bit of bad luck. I mean, these things happen from time to time. It's a bit random, you know. BCG is a quite an irritating vaccine, actually. If you remember the scar in your arm and all that, you know, <laughs> and it will cause a bit of redness and stuff. And that person sadly had a bit of a severe case of that. If that person is not allergic to things, now we all know if you're allergic to say shellfish or peanuts or whatever it is, there's no concern then at all, you know. Now, now the ones who are slightly allergic, uh, they watch them more closely because there was, I think, about 15 people in the end, and that's out of a million who had an allergic reaction all of those were treated and they all got over it you know but just in case if you have an epi pen and if you know you're allergic to other things slightly more caution on the day of the vaccination they'll keep an eye on you they're, they're mandated now to keep you for 30 minutes actually and then treat you if, if you begin to if you begin to get an allergic reaction you know? the reason why it's happening is your immune system's kicking off which is a good thing because of the vaccine and it's a bit like uh, collateral damage because you've got a slightly more active immune system and you begin to get a bit of a reaction you know but as I say, it's extremely rare. So I wouldn't worry about that. The one exception is getting a bit more technical. There's an ingredient in the Pfizer vaccine. It's called polyethylene glycol. It's like antifreeze, to be honest. It's a preservative. Tiny number of people know they're allergic to that. Then you wouldn't take the vaccine. You know? the, the last thing to say, that people might, I've been asked this by others, some are allergic, allergic to the flu vaccine because it's got eggs in it. It's got egg components in it. And some are allergic to the eggs that they wouldn't take the flu vaccine. There's no egg components in these vaccines at all. So there's no need to worry about it. Very good. Um, and, and I suppose to that point, and, and something you're familiar with, uh, where am I? Yes, sorry. John Guyton, Rochford's Bridge, uh, mentioned, will COVID vaccine be effective for people on anti-inflammatory medication, such as infliximab? Yeah. Uh, which I think you'll be fam very familiar with. As this medication yeah, yeah. Well known to suppress the immune system. So That's right. Yeah. Again, no worries, actually. I mean, you might think that sounds a bit unusual because you are on an immunosuppressant, but it turns out other bits of your immune system are okay on that drug, and those bits that you want to get to work against the vaccine are still intact, you know? Now, the one thing that, we've known this for years with other vaccines, by the way, and it was always a concern. The one thing you can't take is what's called a live vaccine. Now, with COVID, there are no, some, some, some diseases, it's actually a live vaccine, it's called live attenuate. The worry with that is it might grow in your body because you're slightly immunosuppressed, you see. So, so that, that's always a don't take a live one. None of these are live, they're bits of the virus, you know. So again, there wouldn't be any concerns. Right. And then would you advise taking the vaccine in circumstances where a person is allergic to penicillin, pethidine, and other antibiotics? Had a previous reaction to the hep C vaccine. Yeah. Um, and that's sorry, that's a question from Jess Carroll. I would, no, I would, I would, but again, you're in a category to be watching for 30 minutes after the vaccination because your immune system is slightly different, you know. And but again, what's the good news here, to be honest, is I know we we're doing, doing lots of good news. We may get a bit more real as we go through this, because we're not out of the woods yet, it must be said. But 
the uh, the Israelis now have given this vaccine to nearly three million people. That's a huge number of people and nothing untoward. Now, in that group, there would be allergic people, there'd be all kinds of people, and it's like you having everything, you know, and it's looking good, you know. So that's in the real world. The worry was uh, not the worry, the issue, I suppose you might say, was we're going to be giving it to 20,000 people in the trial. But now we've got three million on it. In fact, I think there's something like 12 million in the world if I got all the vaccine. And there's no signals to say stop using it. So that's a really good, that's a really good aspect. Yeah. And any, any learnings from Israel on the new variants yet, or have they just, they haven't landed in Israel? Israel is like one big experiment now, I'll tell you that much. And we're watching Israel very closely because there's mass vaccination. 35% of the population actually are vaccinated. Now, the new variant is there, and they reckon it could be as high as 50%. Now, that, that will tell us an awful lot. If that starts to infect the vaccinated people, we better change the vaccine. It takes six weeks, by the way. That's the other thing to say. If there isn't, if the new variant isn't as great in terms of vaccination, it will take five or six weeks. I bet they're making it already, to be honest, just in case, you know. So, yeah. but, but mind you, having said that, I think it will work against that variant. So, but still, we will keep a very close eye on Israel with regard to the variant for that reason. Then. Yeah, and that, that answers Michael Quinn's question as well. But he suffered anaphylactic shock from a coffee, actually. Yeah. Uh, so just. Just keep an eye on it. Yeah. Go for it and keep it. Keep an yeah. eye on it. Um, well, uh, to remember, if you are worried, and it's understandable that there are fears there, there's a high, far higher risk of you getting sick from the virus and having a bad time with it, you know, than a risk of having an allergic reaction to the vaccine. So you're balancing one risk against the other. Yeah, and that, that's important. That's very important to remember. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a good point. Um, what's the magic number? Is it seventy percent, eighty percent? What do you think? It, yeah, uh, and then. Going back to the timelines question, I suppose. Non heart. And if, but if, if the new variant is there, that might mean in a higher percent have to be protected because that's you know, spreading like wildfire. You've got to protect even more, you know? So it's kind of a moving target. At the moment, they're saying 70 to 80% of the population. Now, you've got to remember the children because that includes children. Now, they aren't allowing it to be used in under 16 yet because the trial was only in people over 16. There's a trial at the moment running with children. It it, we're pretty confident it'll be fine in children because that's, you know, if it's good in adults, there's a good chance it'll be fine in children. So we will begin to vaccinate children probably in the summer and beyond, you know. So you need to think about that as well. But having said that, if we get 70% of the adults done, that'll be a great achievement. And remember that the, the reason why this is so important, the herd immunity is important, but probably more important is stopping people from dying and getting sick. And, that, and that's what the vaccine does. So as soon as you vaccinate, remember, what is I think at the moment, the numbers are really amazing. 75% of all deaths are over 65, you see. So if you protect that group, the death rate plummets. Yes. And then the illness rate goes away as well. That's the first thing to look at, actually. I mean, and the next milestone we're looking for is, by the time we get to realistically April, May time, there should be a huge decrease in death rate and illness because of the vaccination campaign. And Israel will see it first, you see. And then we know it's going to come to us next. You know, so it's not going to... Now, to get to the 80%, it means we're all protected. That's great. You know, that's the ultimate goal, of course, in all this. Right. Excellent. Um, so we're having some difficulty. A lot of people can't get in, but we're going to record this and share it afterwards. So please be patient. Is it necessary for somebody who got COVID to get vaccinated? It is at the moment because there's a, even though I said earlier, the evidence suggests if you've been sick with COVID, you won't get reinfected. The, the, we're not 100 percent sure but that's the way on the safe side everybody will get it who's been infected or not uh, we might move to a situation where if supply becomes an issue and my colleague kingston recommended this and i agree with 100 percent if supply becomes an issue when it's widespread rollout those who've had the infection and aren't in a high risk group they could step back for a few weeks because we know there's going to be some level of protection there you know that might be the case but at the moment, everybody is, you know, eligible, shall we say, and that makes sense. Right. And then down to specifics, uh, uh, there's a lot of questions around the specific brands. I suppose let's go with Pfizer first. There yeah. was confusion over the doses, the way some of the Pfizer said there's only six doses. Then the, some hospitals were able to get seven out and therefore yeah. uh, And then we, we talk about the gap then as well between the one, one and two injections. Yeah. Well, again, it just shows you. I, I mean, what, what, what I'm thrilled about, Frank, is the, the, the hunger for this vaccine. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Like, I, I thought to be, oh, hang on, there's reluctance. But by God, they're squeezing every last drop out of those bottles, you know? And that, that was quite a simple thing. They, they put a bit extra in, I suppose, just in case that the volume was there for five anyway. 
But it turns out whatever that machine was, was they, they realized given them up for six. So yeah. they're using all six. And in fact, if you're really good at the old little pipette, you can get seven out. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit yeah, gathering yeah. on the side of the glass thing, you see. So I wouldn't worry about that. They're getting back great bang for their bucks now. Now, of course, um, it's very precious and you've got to use it all up, haven't you? That's the absolutely, key. absolutely, 100%. Now, now, you will need a second shot. Yeah. That's for definite. And the Israelis have now revealed that. So the Israelis are now showing the first shot is given about between 40 and 50% protection. The second shot will get up to 1995. So the next question is, when will you have the second shot? But they say 21 days. And that was done in the trial. But that was a bit of a think of a number thing. They knew it had to be a few weeks, basically. It can go to 28. I think they're saying 42 days max between the two shots. 42 max. Right. Yeah, they reckon that's a reasonable. Now, we know this from the immune system because the first shot gets a good analogy that I've used, which is not a bad one. The first shot gets the players onto the field, right? The second shot is the manager shouting at them. <laughs> <laughs> Score a goal. Okay, yeah, you know, yeah. so that's the way to think. You know? yeah, and you can yeah. shout at them. You can shout at them halfway through the first half or towards the, towards the end of the first half. You know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, the, word, the analogy goes further back. If they're too tired, <laughs> shouting at them won't work. And, and if you go too long, then you might worry you've exhausted it, you know? So hence the 42 days seems like a reasonable one. I reckon they're going to aim for 21 because that, that's what the trial yeah. revealed was the one to go for, you know? But it wouldn't matter too much if, it's, if it extended outside the beyond. And then just to be clear for people, if you get one shot, you still need to socially yeah. isolate. You still need to wear a mask. You're not protected. Absolutely. Fully. Very very important, very precisely. But there's some protection that must be said, but it's it's not optimum. So you're better off just keeping doing what you got used to. It. Anyway, you might just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And then the, the other one. So Moderna is in the country as well, and that's that's getting doled out, and it's going going well. Um, yeah. And that's the same rules with regards separation yeah. and, and and doses. AstraZeneca. There's some questions around the efficacy of yeah. this vaccine. Yeah. Um, the, the, the number isn't. Is it as high? Is it higher? Yeah. Is it good well, in older people? There was a cracking question this morning with Pat on News Talk, right, which came in, right? So uh, some fellow said, oh, listen, he says, the healthcare workers get the Rolls Royce. We're being given the Mars Minor here. <laughs> so that was quite good. And I can reassure him because, see, these numbers are kind of a bit statistical. So it might be 90% efficacy plus or minus 20. You know, some are going to be 70, some are going to be 100. Uh, and that's in the trial. Once you go in the real world, that 90 is bound to drop to 80 or 70, you know? Now, meanwhile, with, with the um, AstraZeneca vaccine, they reported two levels, 62% and 90%. Now, the protocol they're using was the 62% one, which isn't towards the 90. But I bet that gets a bit higher when it's out in the real world, you know? And if there was a 10% difference between that negligible, you know? Yeah. So, so that AstraZeneca vaccine, that's a really good vaccine. It's not as bad as the Mars Minor, but um, yeah. it's really good. And and I would, it's just that if you have a 60% vaccine, the, so the flu vaccine that we take is 60% anyway, you know? Right. So I would, I, I'd just go for it. I wouldn't be worrying that, it, that this one's slightly better than the other one. Yeah. It's not so much cheaper, whether it's an eighth the price. Right. You're saving the HSE money as well. <laughs> we all want to do that. <laughs> and um, in terms of over age groups then as well, it, it's it's over 55s. I think you said that at the start. It's It's perfect it's, it's perfect and in fact another plus for the astrazeneca one was the that, that one there was less injection site reactions in older people with the astrazeneca one ah. so in other words it's a, it's a little more benign in terms of these side effects that's the reason that's not the reason to take it i suppose uh, no they all work in the older people and that was a worry actually because the older people's immune systems aren't as active even if they're healthy like all the rest of your body you know begins to get less effective i suppose but now they've shown they get a great antibody response with all of them, which is great, you know. So I wouldn't worry about the, I wouldn't, I, would, I mean, the view at the moment would be, they're all pretty equivalent. I wouldn't be saying, oh, I'll go for that one over the other one. Now, the fourth one that comes along is Johnson & Johnson. Now, we're expecting that in about, I suppose in about a week now, I suspect the EMA might say, yes, we have the, all the data now and that assess it. It may be available in mid-February. Now, that, that's a one-shot vaccine, you see, and that's much more convenient. Now that might become the one to take because it's a bit easier for you. You don't need to go back in 21 days or whatever. So. And is that the DeLorean or the Volkswagen? Or well, no, <laughs> that's, that's the question, I suppose. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people are keen to know which one you take, but I'm not going to push on the spot because- I would take any of them. You take any, any anyone, of them? Yeah. The first one I can get, that's what I'm I, Can I ask then, what's the, the future of vaccination? And, and I, I have read your book. I have, I have it here with me and I'm going to show it. Good man. Um, oh, very good. Great stuff. 
I recommend everyone to get into it. Great piece on vaccinations. Is this going to become a yearly vaccination? It, is yeah. What we're looking at uh, rolling yeah, the flu vaccine, or as well as, or what? It, it, and I know you're it's best guess at this stage. Yeah, it must be said we don't know. Let's be upfront, but we can begin to think about that now. Um, if these new variants come along which they are doing, right? It's like flu. Every year there's a few new flu variants and the vaccine change, you know? It may be like that. You have to get vaccinated every every winter. Now remember, the, this is a seasonal virus, actually. The evidence from the Christmas experience tells us this. So it loves being indoors, it, as we discussed before. So, so you may see every winter a new variant will come along and then you'd be wise to use the new vaccine against it. That, that's one possible scenario. But on the other hand, there's also evidence say with SARS, which is a related virus, as we know, that gave 17 years protection when, when, when they looked that closely, you know? So you never know. I remember measles, you take one shot as a child, you're protected for, for 20 years. So yeah. that's still a possibility, but we don't know. We're, we're looking at that very closely. We will we'll learn much more as the months go by. If it turned out to be a seasonal once a year shot, that we can live with that. Can't absolutely, we? absolutely. I, I suppose one thing we've learned with our behavior changing with masks and hand hygiene is we there's no flu this year there's no yeah. colds uh, yeah. people are saying they haven't there's... well there's a great bit of science there Frank. why did you hear this so so there's no flu this winter right in the hospitals there's no flu why didn't flu grow up like like covid over christmas because again yeah, we're mixing and mingling them it's because covid19 is definitely more contagious and people weren't going crazy around christmas it was it was a very sort of sad Thing in some ways all we did there was maybe spend two hours indoors together with three families without opening the window that's enough for this to get a foothold it wasn't enough for flu to get a foothold but it was enough for this because it's much more contagious you know there's another interesting comparison i think that's going to happen because there's, literally there's no flu in the hospital so. and, and maybe there'll be the long-term structural things that we take out of this this time this dark time we've all been through um no, well, I think the, the, the future, there was a great thing this week on what the future might look like. And I, and I read it closely and it's a really good piece of science, right? So, so let's say we get everybody vaccinated, right? We're all now protected and we're all now not spreading it, hopefully as well, which we can come back to in a minute, but certainly we're all protected. We're getting sick, you know? Yeah. Every winter then, every year, it's the kids that get vaccinated because they're, 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 they're naive, you know, we're all protected. And then secondly, the vulnerable, just like the flu. And then it becomes endemic. And like, if I was to catch it now, or you, you were as well, any of us. 99% of people don't get sick and get over it and they fight it. They might have a mild disease. It becomes like the common cold in a way, you know? So, so that, that the future is going to look a bit like that. It goes what's called endemic. We'll never get rid of it, folks. Yeah. There's a loyalty somewhere, you know? But we're looking at that kind of vista ahead of us, I suppose, where it will be like the flu. And then even better if you get one shot and you need another one in five years' time, not every winter. You know, great, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then... Uh, Margaret Martin, on a personal note, asks, your love for science, which is undoubted, was there a particular science teacher who inspired you when you were younger? What there, drove you into the world of science or fascinated you by the world of science? There was a hundred percent. Maybe I've, I've thought of this before. So I mean, I'm from Bray, you know, and I went to Prez Bray. Yeah. And my biology teacher, Fran Mooney, let's, let's mention him again. Very he good. inspired all of us. I mean, we all remember. I remember in the oral exam in Irish, like we were all asked and I thought our favorite subject was. And afterwards, uh, this Irish uh, examiner guy said, why did everybody say Beholiac? That was the Irish for biology. <laughs> so, so you really got us all going with the biology. I thought it was superb. So yeah. I dated it to him. I really do. You know, and there's one tiny story I'll tell you, which is quite funny. So about two, must be two years ago now, Pearl Keelan Shanley, who we all remember. Yes. She interviewed me on the radio one day and asked me that question. This is long before I became known more wide. And I mentioned it. And he wrote to me, he said, I heard you mention me on the radio. And he said, I'll come to one of your next lectures. Now, about a month later, I'm giving a lecture, a public lecture actually in Smock Alley Theatre. And I said, I wonder if it's Fran Mooney here. And he put his, I am here, sir. So he put his hand on the table. And then he came up to me at the end. And, and um, I hadn't seen him in 35 years, you think. And, and he went to get, he went to, I, I went to shake his hand. This is, lot, this is before COVID. I went to shake his hand and he hugged me and he really held me very close. And I'm, I'm kind of, oh, this is unusual being a, uptight middle-aged Irish male uh, what's going on and he hugged me and th then we separated and he says oh I don't remember you <laughs> so there you have it but that was the start of it no question I, I doubt it and then when I went to Trinity by the way just, if I continue we great great professors in here they really got me going then you know and that ramped yeah. it up even more so. Oh, and it's steeped in history and chemistry history as well isn't it yeah yeah exactly and yeah. um, did you ever enter the young scientist competition 
I didn't. There, there's a little bit. <laughs> well, even though Fran was great, he was a bit lazy. He wouldn't even think he said it. He was in the audience. Yeah. Uh, Paul O'Farrell wants to ask you about your music tastes, your undoubted music tastes. Oh, your, yes. Your early tastes and, and what inspired you. He, he, he noted the title of the book. and uh, Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you can tell by the book, I was an old punk, I must submit. A silver Doc Martens fan. I want to make that clear. <laughs> excellent, um, excellent. Yeah, well, I, now, to be honest, do you know what got me first? It was the Beatles. I hate to say it's a well-worn thing, and we all would agree, wouldn't we? But they really got me, and I'm still a massive Beatles fan. Maybe number one for me. Uh, they never disappointed in its face, you know. Yeah. But then as the 70s rolled on, and you're in your peer group, it had to be the Sex Pistols in the new clash. And, yeah. You know, and I, I loved them. You know the old, uh, you know, like bad manners. Remember, there was that reggae beat in the in the in the seventies as well. There yeah. were bad manners. There was a special during yeah. um, Ghost Town. I love that. Line. And then I got, then to be honest, then I got a bit more eclectic. I got into folk. Terrifying. Imagine oh, that. Right. Know? Okay. That's a strange. Well, I went to live in England actually. You know, I lived in England for seven years, and you know the way you discover your Irishness when you're living somewhere else. Yeah. I used to hate that folky stuff. Yeah, Irish. yeah, yeah. <laughs> A Christy Moore live album yeah. with the Warren Finn living abroad. Well, I, I remember vividly hearing Planksty and the Botty Band. I was living in London. I went to see them. Yeah, yeah. And of course, being Irish, you were proud. You know, I'm going to go and see this stuff. And it really got me going. So I still love yeah. it. That is brilliant. Listen, I can't thank you enough. And, and thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. We'll be sending out the recording. And, and we'd love to keep in touch. And Absolutely. And we're all looking awesome. forward to a bright future. So thank you very much, Professor O'Neill. And no again, problem. Sorry, just before you go, for anyone who's listening. Good man. A chance. Yeah, order it online on, in Dubray Books. Go on, that's the place. That's it. <laughs> get that into you. It's pure science. It's perfect. Take care. Thank you very much, right. Professor. Thanks a video, Frank. Thanks all for the all the questions, everybody. Bye-bye. Keep going. All the best. Bye.